On July 28, 1984, in Burlington, California, Jennifer Thompson, a 22-year-old college student, was at home alone, sleeping in her bed. And sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard a noise in my bedroom. And when I looked to the left side of my bed, I noticed a person's head. I could hear him moving around on the carpet. Um, so I said, who is that? Who's there? And at that moment, a man quickly jumped up and jumped on me. And uh, I screamed. And he covered my mouth with a gloved hand and put a knife to my throat and told me to shut up or he'd kill me. So I tried to offer him my car and my credit cards and my money um, that I wouldn't call the police. He could just leave. And that's when he told me he didn't want my money. And I knew that I knew what was going to happen. I knew I was going to be raped. Thompson wanted to get a good look at his face, to remember what it looked like for the police. She intentionally studied the man's face to put it into her memory. I decided at that moment that I wouldn't die, that somehow there had to be a way to live. I was going to pay attention to what this person looked like, because when I lived, I was going to make sure he was found and he would, he would be put in prison forever. What is his voice? Does he have an accent? Does he have a scar? Is there a tattoo? The first chance she got, she escaped through the door and ran to her neighbor's house. The suspect fled and raped a second victim half a mile away. Jennifer went to the hospital first and then to the police station to give her statement. The first comment I remember her making was that, I'm going to get this guy that did this to me. She said, I took mm -hmm. the time to look at him. I will be able to identify him if I'm given an opportunity. She described what the man looked like to the police, and they created a sketch of the suspect. She described the suspect as a young, light-skinned black male, around six feet tall, and around 175 pounds. She recalls that during the time that she was working on the sketch, she was doing her best to keep her composure and to keep her memory straight. I mean, he had not only raped me, but he had raped a woman within an hour after me. And so I felt I needed to get him off the streets. I needed to protect the other women in the community. And The composite sketch was released to the public and the police received an anonymous tip that a man named Ronald Cotton looked like the sketch. During investigation, it was discovered that Cotton worked in the area where Thompson was raped and where the other rape that night took place. His boss at the restaurant where he worked told the police that Cotton enjoyed touching white waitresses at work and making inappropriate comments toward them. At the time, Cotton was also on parole and had a record. As a teenager, Cotton was convicted of attempted rape of an acquaintance. The police formed a mugshot photo lineup with other potential suspects and conducted it with Thompson. They told her that the assailant may or may not be in the lineup. After a few minutes, Thompson chose Ronald Cotton out of the lineup. One of the police officers told her, we thought this might be the one, and insinuated to her that Cotton had a prior record. She picked up Ron's photograph and said, that's the man who raped me. Ronald Cotton voluntarily turned himself into the police when he heard that they were looking for him. He wanted to claim his innocence. You know, my mother boyfriend told me, he said, Ron, the cops are looking for you. I said, for what? And uh, he told me for, for rape. I said, I haven't committed such a crime. And once I entered the police department, you know, I identified myself and I was approached and they identified themselves. So they took me upstairs and interrogated me, you know, and asked me my whereabouts on this night. Uh, of course, I, at the time, I was a very young man, 21 years old. And he told police he was out with some friends on the night of the crime. The police could not corroborate his alibi. He comes in and gives me a very detailed uh, account of where he was who he was with that night. As it turns out, uh, that was a false alibi. I realized later that I had got my weekends confused, and so therefore, I gave them the reason to think that I was lying. The police decided to conduct a second lineup. They had Ronald Cotton and six other black men present for Thompson to view live. Cotton was the only individual who was in the first and second lineup. Each man walked forward and turned so she could see them from the side and the front. The police also had them speak, since Thompson told the police that the rapist had a distinct voice. Now we start narrowing down your choices. You can discount A and B. And Thompson told police she was between two of the men. The police had both of these men step out again so Thompson could get another look. 
I can remember looking to the detective and saying, it's between four and five, can I have them do it again? Thompson picked person number five, Ronald Cotton. The police gave Thompson positive feedback again. They told her that Cotton was the same person she picked out in the first lineup. Well, what was said to me afterwards was, that's the same person you picked out in the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, bingo, I did it right. I did it right. In January 1985, the case went to trial. The trial lasted a week, and the prosecution had no physical evidence that matched Cotton to the crime. The semen samples they had were inconclusive. The trial was conducted with the primary evidence being Thompson's eyewitness testimony. At trial, Thompson was completely confident in her testimony when she stated that her rapist was the defendant, Ronald Cotton. The jury deliberated for 40 minutes and then convicted Ronald Cotton of the rape of Jennifer Thompson. Cotton was sentenced to life imprisonment at the age of 22. When Ronald Cotton was in prison, he began to believe that another inmate he met, Bobby Poole, was the actual perpetrator of the crime. Poole was in prison serving a sentence for rape. Yes, I was uh, walking in the prison down a tunnel. I was on my way to work out. Uh, because that's what I did every day. Uh, I worked the punching bag, the body bag, you know, to relieve tension and frustration from me for having to take it out on other inmates. Uh, I recognized this guy being escorted. I looked over and I said, I've seen this guy before. And I walked up to him and I, I said, excuse me. I said, uh, but where are you from? He said, I'm from Burlington, North Carolina. I said, I am myself. I said, you look like the drawing of a composite sketch of a crime that I'm in prison for, did you commit this crime? And he said, no, and he walked away. So I immediately, I went to my locker. I had a composite sketch, you know, of the guy in my locker. So I pulled the file, I looked at it, and I compared it to him. I said, that's him. Cotton and Poole both worked in the prison kitchen together, and other inmates kept getting the two men mixed up. Other inmates also said that Bobby Poole admitted the crime to them. That's when he told me that this guy had told him that he committed the crime I was in for. So I sat up that night about 2 o'clock in the morning and I was writing my attorney, letting him know what was told to me. With this evidence, Ronald Cotton was able to get a new trial. At the trial, Bobby Poole was called to the stand and he denied committing the rape. Jennifer Thompson also testified that Bobby Poole was not the rapist and that Ronald Cotton was. Ronald Cotton was convicted again, and after spending over a decade in prison, modern technology made it possible for the semen sample to undergo DNA testing. The OJ trial was on, and they was talking about DNA, and it caught my attention, and uh, I became interested. So I started listening to it on the television when I could, and once I felt I had enough information you know, about DNA, I decided that I need to take it a little further, and by doing so, I wrote to the courts of appeal to ask for a DNA to be done in my situation. The test found that Ronald Cotton did not match the sample. The DNA matched Bobby Poole. Ronald Cotton was exonerated in 1995. But what led to his conviction in the first place? 300 defendants who were convicted of crimes they didn't do, they spent 10, 20, 30 years in prison for these crimes, and now DNA testing has proven that they're actually innocent. And when those cases have been analyzed, three quarters of them are due to faulty memory, faulty eyewitness memory. Well, why? Like the jurors who convicted those innocent people, Many people believe that, that memory works like a recording device. You just record the information, then you call it up and play it back when you want to answer questions or identify images. But decades of work in psychology has shown that this just isn't true. Our memories are constructive. They're reconstructive. Memory works a little bit more like a Wikipedia page. You can go in there and change it, but so can other people. Our explicit memories, the chronicles of our personal experiences and general knowledge, often require conscious 
effortful work. Had to notice, encode, store, and later consciously retrieve details about the crime she witnessed. What color was the guy's jacket? What did he look like? What did he steal? And where did he run? It takes a lot of work to retrieve memories from long-term storage, and the truth is, a lot can go wrong along the way. In order to understand all of the many fascinating ways you forget things, we need to talk more about how we remember. Our memories are not like books in the library of your mind. You don't just pluck a neatly packaged memory right off the shelf about where you left your phone or the hair color of a fruit. Well, in the late 1960s, American psychologists Richard Atkinson and Richard Schifrin figured out enough about the process of memory formation to break it down into three stages. First, it's encoded into the brain, then stored for future use, and then eventually retrieved. By Atkinson and Schifrin's model, we first record things we want to remember as an immediate but fleeting sensory memory. While Jennifer was encoding, she was hindered by a couple of factors. It was 3 a.m., so it was dark and there was poor lighting. This made it more difficult to study the perpetrator's face. She had just awoken from sleep and was tired and stressed. She was currently the victim of a violent crime and knew she was going to be raped. These all played a role in her ability to encode and store the details she was trying to remember accurately. But this information really only stays in your short-term memory for under 30 seconds without a lot of rehearsal. Because your mind, amazing as it is, can really only hold between four and seven distinct bits of information at a time. At which point, the memory either decays or it gets transferred into long-term memory. The perpetrator also had a knife, which plays into the weapon focus effect which is when the presence of a weapon impairs an eyewitness's ability to accurately identify the perpetrator's face. This highly stressful situation is the worst for encoding information to memory, as the yerkes dodson law points out that moderate levels of stress lead to the best memory, while low stress and high stress lead to the worst memory retention. Further, Jennifer Thompson is Caucasian and her attacker was African American. Studies have pointed out that people have an own race bias. This is the finding that individuals of a particular race are more accurate when identifying others of their own race than those of a different race. All of these factors played a role in how Jennifer encoded information at the time of the rape, how she stored it, and her ability to retrieve it later. But all those factors, the emotion, the retelling, the suggestions of outside sources, combined with the darkness, the quick glimpse, the passing of time, ended up leading to a mistake in the thief's identification. Turns out the human memory is actually a very fragile thing. We're all largely the product of the stories that we tell ourselves. The first lineup was a simultaneous mugshot lineup. In simultaneous lineups, the witness or victim is most likely to choose someone who looks most like the perpetrator. When you're sitting in front of a photo lineup, you just assume one of these guys is the suspect. It's my job to find it. Gary Wells, a professor of psychology at Iowa State University, has been studying eyewitness memory for 30 years. He says when the real guy isn't there, witnesses tend to pick the person who looks most like him. When the real perpetrator is not in the set, is, is none of them, uh, witnesses have a very difficult time being able to recognize that. Without him in the lineup, Ronald Cotton was the one who was in jeopardy. I didn't want to come across, I don't think, as somebody who was like, that's the one. I really wanted to be sure. Well says no good. Recognition memory is actually uh, quite rapid. So we find in our studies, for example, that if somebody's taking longer than 10, 15 seconds, it's quite likely that they're doing something other than just using a, a reliable recognition memory. Another problem is that it was not a double-blind procedure. It was administered by the detective on the case. Jennifer also received positive feedback after selecting Ronald Cotton out of the lineup. Did anybody say to you, good job? Well, what was said to me afterwards was, that's the same person you picked out in the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, Bingo. I did it right. I did it right. This improved her confidence in her selection and started unconscious transference. 
or the misinformation effect. There's a lot of reconstruction and inferring involved when you try to flesh out a memory, and every time you replay it in your mind or relate it to a friend, it changes. Just a little. So, in a way, we're all sort of perpetually rewriting our pasts. While this is an inevitable part of human nature, it can prove dangerous at times. Misleading information can get incorporated into a memory and twist the truth, and yes, there's an effect for this. It's called the misinformation effect. American psychologist and memory expert Elizabeth Loftus has spent decades showing how eyewitnesses inadvertently tweak and reconstruct their memories after accidents or crime. And as part of this training exercise, these soldiers are interrogated in an aggressive, hostile, physically abusive fashion for 30 minutes. And later on, they have to try to identify the person who conducted that interrogation. And when we feed them suggestive information, that insinuates it's a different person, many of them misidentify their interrogator, often identifying someone who doesn't even remotely resemble the real interrogator. And so what these studies are showing is that when you feed people misinformation about some experience that, that they may have had, you can distort or contaminate or change their memory. Well, out there in the real world, misinformation is everywhere. Interfering or misleading information may also manifest itself as source misattribution, like when you forget or misrecall the source of a memory. Unconscious transference took place in the case of Jennifer Thompson and Ronald Cotton. After the positive feedback from the detective, Jennifer began to process Ronald Cotton's face into her working memory through rehearsal. Since she believed that Ronald Cotton was the man who raped her, she placed Ronald Cotton's face into her memory that night. So whenever she recalled the memory of the rape, she pictured Ronald Cotton's face. This now became stored in her long-term memory. It was based on a composite sketch that I helped the police do mm -hmm. that led to a suspect, mm -hmm. that led to a photograph lineup, that led to a physical lineup. And I was able to pick him out every time. Cotton was the only one that was present in both lineups. This made him a familiar face. After deliberating between Cotton and another suspect, she ended up picking Cotton. However, Jennifer was not comparing the faces in the second lineup to her initial memory of the rape. She was comparing them to the face she had stored in her memory from the mugshot lineup. Her memory of Ronald Cotton was correct, as she had seen his face before, but she had applied it in the wrong context. Jennifer also received positive feedback again after the second lineup, further encouraging her confidence well studied what that reinforcement does. What this seems to be saying is that a reinforcement alters memory. It does. Dramatically. It does. This can help us understand why Jennifer can be sitting in a courtroom mm -hmm. and be looking at Bobby Poole, the original rapist, and looking at Ronald Cotton and saying, saying no, it's not Poole, it's Cotton, because she has been picking him. Yeah. All along. This is why when she saw Bobby Poole, she said he was not the rapist. Because she did not follow through with attention, encoding, storage, and retrieval process. She stored Ronald Cotton's face to that night and not Bobby Poole's. So when she retrieved her memory, it was altered. You're looking into the face of the man who raped you, whose face you had studied so intently. And there's no flicker, nothing, nothing. between you and, and Bobby Poole. Nothing. Nothing. I, and I've gone back there many times trying to think, was there? Was there ever a moment? Did I ever look at him and think, <gasps> And I didn't. But her memory of the event had probably already been tweaked several times before she even made it into the courtroom. Like, she relived the tale multiple times in her own mind and when she told other people about it, and every time she introduced errors, filling in memory gaps with reasonable guesses. Not only that, but we know Nice was already tired and stressed when she witnessed the event, and we know our emotions can influence whether we remember or whether we forget. Because memory is both a reconstruction and a reproduction of past events, we can't ever really be sure if a memory is real just because it feels real. This led to her at trial being 100% certain that Cotton was the perpetrator, although she was hesitant after her first and second pick. Confidence at the time of trial is not an indication of confidence at the time of the initial lineup.
deal. Elizabeth Loftus knows this. She's frequently called in to testify against the accuracy of eyewitnesses. In fact, of all the U.S. prisoners who have been exonerated based on DNA evidence presented by the Innocence Project, a nonprofit legal group, 75% of them were convicted by mistaken eyewitnesses. That is a lot of innocent people. If I've learned anything from these decades of working on these problems, it's this. Just because somebody tells you something and they say it with confidence, just because they say it with lots of detail, just because they express emotion when they say it, it doesn't mean that it really happened. We can't reliably distinguish true memories from false memories. We need independent corroboration. And to wonder whether there should ever be eyewitness <laughs> testimony in uh, trials. Well, because of the tricks that memory plays. Yeah. I, I think what's important, though, is, is to understand that, know that. Know it as a police officer, as an investigator, uh, as, as attorneys. Since the police believed they had an accurate and confident eyewitness identification, they thought there was no need to pursue other suspects or leads. However, we now know that a high level of confidence does not equal accuracy. This is problematic at trial, since eyewitnesses can be highly influential. You believe that person because they have no reason to lie. Yeah. The legal system is set up to kind of sort between liars and truth tellers, and, and it's actually pretty good at that. But when someone is genuinely mistaken, the legal system doesn't really know uh, how to deal with that, and we're talking about a genuine error here. Juries can be instructed on this information, since the average layperson does not have this knowledge. As well, Educating police officers and lawyers about the effects of eyewitness memory can aid in eliminating tunnel vision. Further, police should conduct double-blind procedures in all photo lineups, so intentional or unintentional influence cannot occur. He says the solution is to have someone independent administer the lineup, someone who doesn't even know who the suspect is and certainly not the detective on the case. As a better way would have been to show Jennifer lineup photos or people one at a time so that she would compare each one directly to her memory rather than to one another. Using a suspect only once in a lineup is crucial so the witness does not develop source monitoring errors. With these reforms in place, less wrongful convictions can take place due to these factors and people like Ronald Cotton will not spend 10 years in prison for a crime they did not commit.